For many years, the most common way computers displayed information on a monitor was through this ubiquitous VGA interface. But how does it work? What electrical signals does a computer need to send into this thing in order to get a picture to show up? Now, this connector has 15 pins, but aside from some uh, grounds here, actually a bunch of these pins are ground, there's only five signals that we really care about. There's red, green, blue, horizontal sync, and vertical sync. Some of these other pins are, are sometimes used in different ways for the computer and monitor to communicate about what resolutions the monitor supports, things like that. But those are all optional. So we can just ignore everything but those five pins. And the way this works is pretty closely tied to the way old school CRT monitors worked. In those old monitors, you had an electron gun pointed at the screen with electromagnets around here that could deflect the electrons to different parts of the screen. Then to paint an image, the electron beam just scans across the screen from left to right and top to bottom. Of course, that's not actually how it works in a modern flat panel monitor, but the timing of that electron beam physically sweeping across the screen is still what defines the timing of when we need to send each pixel. And we don't just need to worry about the order of the pixels and the time from one pixel to the next. There are also these margins on the top and bottom, left and right, uh, for the electron beam to, to sort of have a chance to stabilize or, or you kind of think of it coming up to speed before it paints the next scan line. Then it blanks and has a little extra room on the right here before the beam swings back to the left, which, which also takes time for the beam to swing back to the left uh, to start the next scan line. And then same thing at the bottom of the image, there's some blank scan lines down here before the beam gets sent back up to the top left for, for the next frame. And so there's this physical process that the timing is based on. So even though a more modern monitor doesn't use the same physical process, we've got to follow the same timing in order to get an image to show up. And so this diagram shows the detail of what that timing looks like. The visible part of each scan line takes some amount of time, and that's followed by what's called the front porch, which is just the blank time on the right side of the image. Then you get the sync pulse, which is a separate signal line, this horizontal sync signal, that tells the electron beam to swing back to the left side of the image. And then the back porch is the blank time on the left side of the image before the next scan line starts. And then it's the same at the end of the entire frame. So you get to the end of the frame, there's a front porch uh, which is the time to account for blank scan lines down at the bottom of the image, and then a vertical sync pulse, which is the signal and also the time that it takes for the electron beam to get sent back up to the top left of the display. And then there's a back porch, which accounts for blank scan lines that are at the top of the next frame. But what matters here is that for any particular display resolution a monitor supports, we've got to get these timings right. So the horizontal sync and vertical sync uh, signals are the are pins 13 and 14 on our connector here. We've got to get the timings of those signals right in order for the image to show up properly. And in fact, with older CRT monitors, if you didn't get the timing right, you could actually damage the monitor because you could get the electron gun pointing somewhere where it shouldn't be pointing. And I don't think it's possible to damage newer flat panel monitors, but uh, if you do manage to end up damaging your monitor, I don't, want you, I don't want to hear about it. Don't blame me. Actually, I do want to hear about it, but, but don't blame me. Okay, so getting the timing right is important, but what are the exact timing requirements? Well, if we look up VGA signal timing, you can see in this first link, there's a whole bunch of different resolutions and, and different modes. And a good video card would support a, a bunch of these resolutions and maybe even communicate with the monitor over some of those data pins I said to ignore uh, to pick the best mode. But my goal is not to make a good video card. My goal is just to get something working. So, you know, I'm looking for one of these modes, you know, any mode that I think is going to be easiest to build hardware for. And, you know, there's a bunch of trade-offs. So depending how you think about it, you might come up with a different choice and, and that's fine. But, you know, I figure I want to avoid the, the larger resolutions here because that's just a lot more image data to worry about. And, you know, then I'm just looking at the different pixel clock frequencies here. You know, since I'm going to need to build a clock that runs at one of these frequencies. And, you know, these are all in the tens of megahertz. So that probably means using a crystal oscillator of some sort. And I've got a bunch of crystals, different frequencies, and uh, of course, none of them are any of the frequencies we want. Um, and I also have some of these integrated crystal oscillator can things that you can just uh, hook five volts up to and it spits out a nice clock. Um, in this case, uh, this one's 10 megahertz. But unfortunately, nothing I have matches any of, of these clock frequencies. However, I can actually use a slower pixel clock as long as I compensate by sending fewer pixels. So for example, I could use that 10 megahertz oscillator here instead of the uh, 40 megahertz pixel clock. But of course, you know, timing is still critical. You know, I can't change the overall timing. But the times that matter here are, are these times here, and, and they're based on the pixel frequency, but they're also based on the number of pixels. Right, because what really matters is how long does it take to draw each scan line? How much time do we spend in the display? How much, uh, how long is this front porch? How long is this sync pulse in terms of time? Um, and, and so forth. And so that's what matters, and that's what these times are here. So this 20 microseconds of how long it takes to draw the visible area of one scan line is based on having 800 pixels divided by 40 million pixels per second, and that's 20 microseconds. 
But if instead of a 40 megahertz clock, we're using a 10 megahertz clock, well, 200 pixels divided by 10 million pixels per second is still 20 microseconds. And so the timing will still work out. And then same thing with the front porch, the sync pulse, and the back porch, right? Because if our front porch, we get to 200 pixels here, and we keep going another 10 pixels, well, 10 pixels divided by 10 million pixels per second is one microsecond. And so that, that front porch will take the right amount of time. And then same thing with the sync pulse. If we just keep counting another uh, 32 pixel times, 32 uh, pixel times divided by 10 million per second is 3.2 microseconds. And so our sync pulse will be exactly the right length. And so as long as we divide all these pixel numbers by four, and conveniently they're all divisible by four, uh, we use these numbers, our overall scan line is still going to take 26.4 microseconds, even with this 10 megahertz clock. So that's what I'm going to do. So I guess to start out, what I'm going to do is build a circuit that's going to count pixels, because we need to know where we are. We need to know, you know, are we at pixel zero? Or are we at pixel 50? When do we get to pixel 200? When, when are we in this range here where the sync pulse needs to be, uh, be low? So to do that, I'm going to build a counter that will just count pixels, and then when it gets to 264, we'll reset it. And that'll count the pixels horizontally, and then we'll end up building another one to count where we are in terms of which line we're on. And so to count the pixels, I'm going to use the 74LS161. Um, and because we've got to be able to count all the way up to 264, that's going to take 9 bits. And the 74LS161 is a 4-bit counter, so in order to get uh, at least 9 bits, I'm going to need 3 of them. So I'll start by connecting the power and ground pins for each one. And then we'll just kind of go through each of the pins and hook them up. So the clear pin is what's going to reset all of our counters to 0. So we want to be able to uh, clear all of them at the same time once we get to 264. So I'm just going to tie the clear pins together for now. And then the clock pin is kind of the same way. They're all going to use the same clock, so I'm just going to tie the clock pins together for now. And eventually I want to connect that uh, clock pin to our 10 megahertz oscillator, but I'm going to leave it out for now just because in order to test it, I want to be able to run it at a slower speed to start with. So next we have our data inputs, and we're not going to use that because we're never going to load a value into this. We just want this to count. So I'm just going to leave all those disconnected. But the enable pins we do want connected, so I'm going to connect them all high so that the chips are always enabled. And again, because we're not using these inputs for anything, the load pin over here, we, we don't want to use that either. And that's an active low, so I'm going to tie them all high. And then this other enable pin, this enable T, I'm going to enable the first one. But the other two I'm not going to always have enabled, uh, because this is actually how the ripple carry works. So we're going to count the first four bits on the left here, and then we want it to roll over and count the next four bits here, and then roll over and so forth. And so the way that works is we connect the ripple carry output of the first chip to the enable of the second chip. And then the ripple carry output of the second chip will connect to the enable of the third chip. And that way we've cascaded these together uh, so that we will be able to count actually 12 bits because there's, you know, four, they're four bits each, uh, but we really only care about the first nine bits. And so that should be all we need in order to get a counter going. So what I'll do is connect the outputs up to some LEDs so we can see if it works. So there we go. I've got the first 10 bits, even though we only really care about the first nine bits, got the first 10 bits hooked up to those LEDs. If we power this up, uh, well, nothing happens because we don't have our clock yet. If we just hook our 10 megahertz clock up, we're not going to see anything. This is just going to be counting so fast that it just looks like all the LEDs are on. So now for a slower clock, I could use a, a 555 circuit like I've shown in a previous video. But actually, what I'm going to do is use this fancy signal generator, since it'll give me a lot more control over the exact frequency. And so we want to set this up for a square wave. And then the high level will be uh, 5 volts. And then we need to set the low level, and that'll be 0 volts. So that way we'll get a square wave that goes from 0 volts to 5 volts. And then the frequency here is uh, 1 kilohertz, and yeah, that seems fine. We'll start there. And so I'll hook the output of the signal generator up to our clock input here. So that'll go right into our clock for all three chips. And so now if I turn on the signal generator, and there we go. It looks like it's counting, uh, but it's counting pretty fast. Uh, we can slow it down. Let's try 100 hertz. And that's not working as well. But you know what? Our clear uh, is not actually, they're hooked together, but they're not actually hooked to ground or, or 5 volts. So I think ground, yeah, ground clears it, but if we hook it to 5 volts, there we go. So it was just sort of clearing itself because that was floating. But now you can see it's counting in binary, which is what we want. And we can slow it down even more if we want to. But really what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to know when we get to these different time uh, points here. So we want to start counting at 0, but then we want to know when we get to 200, we want to know when we get to 210, when we get to 242, and when we get to 264. And then actually at 264, we want to reset it back to 0. Well, how can we tell that? Well, to figure out when the counter gets to 200, you know, we're counting in binary, so this is going to be the, the binary equivalent here uh, for 200. So 
all of the bits are zeros except for these three, right? We've got the 128's place, the 64's place, and the 8's place, and that, that makes 200. So we have these signals that look like this, those three ones that are set, and we want to be able to detect when we get here. What we can do is we can actually invert all the bits that are supposed to be zeros and not invert the bits that are ones, and then over here on the right, um, all of these are going to be ones when we get to 200. Then what we can do is we can just feed all of that into a NAND gate, and the output of that NAND gate will go low only when all of the inputs are high, and all of those inputs are going to be high, or, or all of those inputs are going to be ones, only when our counter over here is actually at 200. Now you may have noticed I only hooked up eight of the bits. There's this ninth bit that's kind of uh, hanging out up here. Well, that's because we can use the 74LS30, which is an eight input NAND gate, but it's, it's only eight inputs. Uh, and as far as I know, they don't make a nine input NAND gate. But that's actually okay because looking at these eight bits is actually enough to know that we've gotten to 200. Because this ninth bit up here is the 256's place. So if that actually were a one, uh, and the rest of these bits were, were set the way they are, then the overall value would be you know, 200 plus the 256 place would be 456. But remember, when we get to 264, we're gonna reset our counter back to zero. So you know our counter's never gonna get up to 456. So we don't have to worry about this being a one. If the rest of these are set the way that they are, then we know this is going to be a zero since we're never going to go over 264. So it's fine to just ignore that one. So this will detect when we get to 200, and we can do a similar thing to detect when we get to 210. Uh, we just have to look at different bits, right? So to match the value 210 that we're looking for. And then same for 242 as well, same basic idea, right? We just have the bits that we're looking for, and we just put the inverters where we need them in order to detect that with the NAND gate. And then finally, this is what it looks like for 264. But now in this case, we do need to look at that first bit to make sure it's actually a one. Because if, if this were a zero, you know, the rest of these bits, this is the only other bit set and that's the eights place. So if, if this were a zero up here, uh, the overall counter value would be at eight, which you know, we're gonna get to eight long before we get to 264. And so we would detect this, this early. So that's no good. We've gotta make sure that first bit is a one. But in this case, it's, it's actually okay to ignore the last bit here, right? This last zero, because if this value here is 264 and we change that to a one, then it's gonna be 265. But of course, when we get to 264, we reset back to zero. So it's never gonna to get to two, uh, 265. So whenever these first eight bits are set like this, we know the last one can't be a one. So we don't have to check if it's a zero. So in all of these cases, we got uh, lucky that we can kind of cheat and only look at eight of the bits. Now, obviously we've got a lot of inverters here, but a lot of them are duplicates. We really just need one per bit like this. So we've got the nine bits coming in and then we invert all of them. And so then we've got the inverted and non-inverted version of each bit. And then when we decode each of the numbers we're interested in, we can just kind of pick off the inverted or non-inverted copy of, of each bit that we need, depending on whatever number we're trying to, uh, to decode. So this is what we need to build. And I'm gonna start off with uh, nine inverters. So to invert each of the signals, I'm gonna use the 74LS04, which has six inverters. And we need nine of them, so I'm gonna have two of these chips. And so now I'll just hook up each output to the input of an inverter. Okay, and so now we have all of our outputs uh, for a counter, all nine bits anyway that we care about, hooked up to inverters, which means now we've got inverted and non-inverted copies of all of our counter signals over here that we can use to detect those four values we're looking for. So next we need to add those NAND gates. So I'll add another uh, breadboard here where we can do that. And then here's the first uh, 74 LS30, which is uh, an eight input NAND gate that'll let us decode one of those values. And the first one I'll do is 264, because that's the one that uh, also resets us back to zero. So that'll be a, a good one to have. So let's try to detect the number 264. So starting on the right here, the first bit is a zero. We actually don't care about that, because remember, we're gonna look at just uh, the top eight bits. So we'll just ignore the first bit. So the next bit's gonna be a zero. So we'll hook up one of the inputs here to the inverted output of not the first one, but the second one. So that's our second bit is zero. And the third bit from the right is also a zero. So I'll hook that one up to our inverted output of our third bit here. Then the, the next bit is gonna be a one. So I'm gonna hook that not to the output, but to the input of this inverter here. So that's just gonna be the same as the output of our counter. And I'll hook that up to another input. And what I'll do is the inverted uh, uh, lines, I'll use blue, and then for the non-inverted ones, I'll use green. So it's sort of easier to tell what's what. So that's a one. And so then we've got four more zeros. So I'll hook that to the inverter output of the next bit, then another zero will go to the inverted output of the next bit, and then another zero going to the inverted output of the next bit, and then one more zero, followed by that ninth bit is gonna be a one. So I can just hook that directly to the input of this last inverter, because that's connected directly over to this ninth bit of our counter. All right, so we've got all the inputs of our AND gate hooked up there. I suppose I should also connect power and ground for our new chip over here. And then the output is pin eight here. 
let me just hook an LED to that to see what's going on. And if I connect power, that's on. And of course that's on because this is a NAND gate, so the output's inverted. So that's going to be on unless we've got exactly uh, the value 264 in our counter. So if we reset our counter here by tying our reset here to low and then back to high, we should have a zero in our counter, so not 264. But if we send 264 pulses, then that LED should go out. And it's sending it, and oh, hey, it went out. So there we go, we've detected our 264 pulses. And if we send one more pulse, so let's see, one more pulse, and we need to trigger it. So there we go, trigger. And it's still off. Oh, because now we've sent 265, and remember we're ignoring that last bit. So we actually need to send one more pulse. And there we go, so now we're at 266, and the LED has come back on again. All right, so we're able to detect that 264. Now we just need to do the same thing for these other three numbers, 242, 210, and 200. So let's add another NAND gate, and let's hook up for 242. So remember, for this one, we were just looking at the top eight bits. Here, we're just gonna look at the bottom eight bits, and that should be enough to be able to detect 242. So okay, that first bit is a zero, so that's gonna be the inverted output of our first bit down here. It's gonna go to one of our inputs up here. Then our next bit's gonna be a one. So we actually wanna go from the non-inverted, just the input of our inverter, for that next bit, and bring that up there. Okay, so zero, one, the next uh, is gonna be a zero, and that's the third bit, so that's this third inverter down here, which we've already got coming up to here. Really what we need to do is just bring that same inverted bit down and use that as an input. Okay, so we have zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, the next is gonna be a zero, so that's our fourth bit is gonna be a zero, so that fourth bit comes over here, and then that output is there, this is a zero. So we've got zero, one, zero, zero, and then one, 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 one. So the next four inputs are all gonna be uh, ones. So this is gonna go to input there, and then the next one's gonna go to the next input there, and then the next two are gonna go to the next two inputs over here. Okay, so we got zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 one. So zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 one. So assuming I hooked all that up right, of course we need to add power and ground. So now this should be able to detect uh, 242. So we're not at 242 now, that's a good sign. All right, so we got the first two, we got the 264 and 242, so now we just need to do the same thing for 210 and 200. And so this is basically the same exercise. We're gonna add another uh, eight input NAND gate and hook up all of the appropriate inputs so that it uh, detects the, the, you know, the number 210. And then again, we'll do the same thing with another NAND gate and hook up all the inputs for that so that we're able to detect the number 200. Okay, so now we should be able to detect all four of these numbers, so let's test it out. If I reset, uh, we aren't on any of these numbers, we're Hopefully it's zero, because I just reset it. And now I'll send uh, 200 pulses. And there we go, we got our 200. And now I'll send another 10 to get to 210. And now we're at 210. So I'll send another 32 to get to 242. That's 242. And I'll send another 22 to get to 264. And there we are at 264. And actually, when we get to 264, what we want to do is reset our counter so that we start back at zero again. What I'll do is just hook the output of that over around to our reset signal. So now if I just let the clock run continuously, I don't know if you can see it, but these LEDs are flicking out very briefly. Uh, there they go. I'm not sure if you can tell on camera, but they're, but you know it's going through the cycle. So at 200, 210, 242, uh, and 264, these LEDs are going off very briefly just for one clock cycle. But what we really want is we want to be able to tell when we're in the different sections of this signal. So for example, we want to know, should we be displaying pixels or not? Or should we be sending the sync pulse or not? And so for that, what we really want is we want to know, are we between pixel zero and pixel 200? Or are we between pixel 210 and pixel 242? And right now, all we have is just a pulse when we get to each of those points. But what we can use is we can use an SR latch. And this is actually an inverted SR latch because our outputs here are active low, so we want the inverted set and the inverted reset. And if you want to know more about the SR latch, I've got a video on that, so you can check that out up there. But what we want to do is we want to be able to say, okay, when we get to zero, or actually, which is the same as 264, because when we get to 264, we're going to reset and be at zero uh, right away anyway. So when we get to 264, we want to set this latch. And then when we get to 200, we want to reset it. And then our output Q will be high if we should be displaying pixels, and low if we're in the blanking section over here. And then we can use another SR latch for our, our H-sync, our horizontal sync signal. And in that case, at 210, which is uh, that guy, we'll set the latch. And then at 242, we'll reset the latch. And then the Q will indicate whether our horizontal sync should be active or not. Or actually, since this is a, a low going pulse, we can just use the inverted Q for that. And that'll actually be our H-sync signal. So 
Uh, to build this SR latch, we're using two NAND gates. And so we can use a 74LS00, which actually has four NAND gates on it. So I'll hook up power and ground, and then I'll hook up the two cross connects for the first SR latch. So that's just these two connections here from the outputs back around to the inputs. And so for the first uh, SR latch, we want to set it when we get to, well, zero, but, but also when we get to 264. So when we get to the end, we want to set this. So that'll be this signal here, which actually is already kind of snaking around here. I'll hook that up. So we'll set this latch when we get to 264. And then we want to reset it when we get to 200, which is this guy here. So we'll take the output there for 200, and that's where we'll reset. And then if we look at the output of this, what we see is that when it's on, that's when we should be sending pixels, and then when it goes off, that's our blanking interval. All right, so that's that should be on from 0 to 200, and then it goes off from 200 to 264, and then it comes back on again. So now let's do the same thing for our sync pulse. So again, I'll hook up those cross connects. So that's our second SR latch. And this one's going to be set at uh, 210, and then reset at 242. So now I'll grab another of these LEDs and look at the output of this one. And so that's our sync pulse. So we have our display when that's on, and then we get here to our blanking, and then in our blanking, you see the sync pulse. Okay, so we know when our display interval is, we know when our blanking interval is, and we've also got a horizontal sync pulse. But the whole purpose of setting all this up is so that we could get the timing right down to the, these microsecond values for each of these intervals. Uh, but, uh, but that all assumes that we're using a 10 megahertz clock. So let's get our signal generator out of here and actually set up our 10 megahertz clock. So this is the 10 megahertz uh, little oscillator thing. And I'm just going to hook this up. And th these are pretty easy to use. Basically, you just hook up power and ground. So power is this pin up here on the top left. And ground is the pin over on the bottom right. And as long as you've got power and ground hooked up like that, you'll get a 10 megahertz signal coming out of this top right pin here that we can feed into our clock. And it's kind of hard to tell if that actually did anything because our LEDs just appear to be on. But of course, if we're going at 10 megahertz, these intervals are going to be so fast that, you know, these are in microseconds, the whole line takes 26.4 microseconds. So we're not really going to see the LEDs doing anything. So what we really need to do is get these LEDs out of here and hook up an oscilloscope where we can measure the times exactly. So I'll hook up one oscilloscope probe here to our display interval, and then I'll hook another here over to the sync pulse. And now if we look at the oscilloscope, we'll see both of those signals here. So this is the display interval, and then during the blank period there, we see the sync pulse. And you know, actually, we want the sync pulse to be high, and then it goes low for that sync pulse here, um, instead of the other way around. So instead of looking at the Q output of our SR latch here, we can just pop over here to the not Q output, the inverted output, and we should see, we should see the sync pulse that looks the right way. So this looks right, but let's actually verify each of these times. So the visible area should be 20 microseconds. So if we want to measure that positive going part of this signal, we can uh, use this option here just to look at that width. And that shows 19.9 or, yeah, about 20 microseconds. So that's exactly what we would expect here is 20 microseconds. Um, and then we can look at the sync pulse as well. So that should be 3.2 microseconds. So in this case, we need to go to channel 2, and then we want to look at the uh, negative going width. So let's bring that up. And that's 3.2 microseconds. And so that's the negative going time of our sync pulse is 3.2 microseconds. So, so far, it looks like we've got these, these timings perfect. If we want, we can even measure the front porch and back porch times. So if we zoom in here a little bit, uh, we can bring up the cursors. There we go. So we can move cursor A over here to the start of the blanking interval. And then cursor B, we can move over to the start of the sync pulse. And then cursor A minus cursor B is about one microsecond, which is exactly what the front porch ought to be, one microsecond. And then we can do the same thing for the back porch. So move cursor B over to the end of the blanking interval, and then cursor A we can bring over to the end of the sync pulse, and then B minus A is 2.1 microseconds, and it's supposed to be 2.2, although maybe that's close enough, or well, I guess it says uh, 2.16, so that's even, even closer. So that takes care of our horizontal sync signal. We're generating this perfectly. So next we need to generate the vertical sync signal, and it's going to work pretty much the same way. It's just instead of counting pixels across the screen, we're going to count scan lines down the screen. So every time we go through this 264 pixels across, we're going to count one line down. And then we need to know when we're between 0 and 600 so we can display stuff. And then we need to know when we're between 601 and 605 so we can output the vertical sync signal to the monitor. And so if we look at the timing requirements here, so these times are just based on the times up here. So with our 10 megahertz clock, you know, we're generating these times correctly now.
And because each whole scan line is going to take 26.4 microseconds, all of these times are going to work out as long as we just count the number of lines correctly. So really, we just need to build a circuit identical to what we just built that counts up to 628 and detects 600, 601, 605, and 628. And so just like before, we can take the number 600 and feed that into some inverters and an AND gate and detect when we get there. Now one difference is this time around, you know, to be able to count up to 628, it's going to take 10 bits. So we've got a couple extra inputs here, uh, but we're, we're still able to cheat a little bit. We don't need to, we don't actually need to check either of these two bits. Because again, this is the, this is the 128th place. So if this were a one, then this would be 728. And because we're only counting to 628, we never need to check if, the, if, if these are ones as long as the other eight bits that we are checking are correct. And then here's how we would check for 601. Basically the same, except that last bit is now a one instead of a zero. And then 605 is just a little bit different. And finally, 628. And you notice with all of these, there are these two bits here that we don't ever have to check. So in all of these cases, just like before, we can get away with that eight input NAND gate, which is very convenient. The other thing that's kind of convenient here is that some of these bits like this one, well, and the first one, are always one, at least in the cases that we want to check. And so we, we can save ourselves an inverter there because we never need to check if that particular bit is zero. So overall, this is what we're going to need to build. And you can see we only need five inverters for this to work. These two bits we never need to check. And then these bits, whenever we check them, we're only checking if they're ever a one. But otherwise, this circuit's going to be very similar to what we just built. We're just going to have 10 bits for our counter. And we're checking now for 600, 601, 605, and 628. So this is our horizontal timing circuit. And I'm just going to add a few more breadboards here where we can build our vertical timing circuit. So I'll start by building the counter that'll let us count up to 628. And to count up to 628, we need 10 bits instead of the nine bits we needed before. But uh, 374LS161 is going to give us 12 bits to count with. So that's still more than enough. Then I'll add the inverters that'll help us decode the different values that we're looking for. And then hook the outputs of the counter up to the inputs of those inverters. Then I'll add the four NAND gates that we're going to use to decode the four different values that we're looking for. So three of the bits are always ones. I can just hook all three of them up to all four of the NAND gates. And then I'll just hook the rest of the counter bits up, either inverted or non-inverted, to the four NAND gates to detect the 600, 601, 605, and 628 that we're looking for. And so that should detect 600, 601, 605, and 628. And when we get to 628, we want to reset our counter. So I'll hook 628 up to the reset signal for our counter. And then we want the SR latch so that when we reset uh, at 628, we set the latch and then reset it when we get to 600. So we have a signal that'll tell us if we're in our display area. And then the other latch, which will set on 601 and reset on 605. So we'll add a quad NAND gate and build our two SR latches. So the bottom one's going to keep track of when we're displaying our image. So we want to reset that, or we want to set that rather, when we reset the counter. And we want to clear it when we get to line 600. And then the top SR latch is going to generate our vertical sync pulse. So we want to set that when we get to 601 and reset it when we get to 605. And so now we've got two timing circuits. We've got a horizontal timing circuit that counts pixels across the screen. So this is sort of what column we're on that this is counting. And then it generates our horizontal sync pulse. And then the vertical timing circuit counts which line on the screen we're on and generates our vertical sync pulse. Now for our horizontal timing, we're using a 10 megahertz crystal because we're essentially putting out 10 million pixels per second as we scan across the line. But for our vertical timing, we don't want that to count every time we put out a pixel. We want that to count for each line that we put out. So in other words, when we're done drawing a horizontal line, so in other words, we get to 264 with our horizontal counter, that's when we want to increment our vertical counter and go to the next line. So the reset signal down here for a horizontal counter, we can use that as the clock for the vertical counter. So let's power this up and reconnect the oscilloscope to make sure our horizontal timing is still working correctly. And so this still looks pretty good. Yep, that looks like about what we would expect. So now let's also hook the oscilloscope up to take a look at the vertical timing and see what that looks like. And so let me turn on these uh, other two channels here so we can see that. And I'll have to move things around a little bit and uh, change the scale here. So let's uh, try to try to fit everything on the screen here. OK, so here we are. And it looks like something is happening with our vertical timing. But of course, the vertical timing is much slower than the horizontal timing, since there's going to be 628 of these pulses for every vertical frame. So we're going to need to zoom out a bit. And then I can also set this to trigger on that channel 3. So there we go. And if we zoom out a little bit more, we should start to see the vertical timing. And so just like before, we can take a couple measurements just to make sure this is working right. 
So if we want to look at the width of the visible area, that should be 15.84 milliseconds. So that's going to be this right here. And there we go, 15.8 milliseconds. So that uh, seems pretty close. And then the sync pulse here should be 0 0.1056 milliseconds. So you know, we should be able to measure that as well. So let's go to channel four. And then we want to see the negative pulse width. And we might need to zoom in to get a better measurement of this. So there we go. So that's saying it's 108 microseconds. And 108 microseconds is going to be 0 0.108 milliseconds. So that's probably pretty, pretty close. And if I zoom in even more, you can see the precision's even better. So here I'm even closer to that 0 0.1056. And the other thing you can see is that when the visible area ends, there's one horizontal sync pulse before we get to the vertical sync pulse. And then the vertical sync pulse you can see is one, two, three, four horizontal sync pulses. And so all of that matches. After our visible area, we've got one line followed by our sync pulse, which is four lines long. So it looks like we're generating all of this timing properly. So let's go ahead and actually try hooking up a VGA monitor. So VGA uses this 15 pin connector and actually five of those pins are grounds. So there's the ground and then a separate ground for red, green, and blue and a sync ground. Uh, plus the outer shell is actually a ground. So I've hooked all of those grounds together. And so I've got a ground connection here. And then pin 13 is horizontal sync uh, and pin 14 is vertical sync. So let's actually try hooking this up to our circuit. So I'll hook the ground up and then our horizontal sync, I'll hook up uh, here. And then vertical sync, I'll hook up to our vertical sync. And so now if we actually plug a monitor into this, you can see the monitor comes out of standby. And of course the display itself is blank because we're not sending any picture to it yet. But if we go into the menu here, we can actually see what mode it's in. And you can see it, it thinks it's in 800 by 600 mode. And it says the horizontal frequency is 38 kilohertz and the vertical frequency is 60 hertz. And that all matches what we're trying to do here. 800 by 600 at 60 hertz timing. And the vertical refresh rate is 37.8 kilohertz. And so with our two sync signals here, we've managed to fool the monitor into thinking that it's in this mode. So now all we need to do is send the actual pixels, the red, green, and blue signals you know, in the right order to draw a picture. And that's what I'm gonna tackle in the next video. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and click that bell to turn on the notifications so you'll be sure to know when the next video comes out. And if you feel like supporting the creation of more content like this, head on over to my Patreon page and sign up at whatever level feels comfortable. I really do appreciate everyone who helps make these videos possible.